Um, can we have a quorum? Okay. And I'd like to declare the meeting open to the public. Um, I want to advise members that the committee meeting will be recorded and broadcast throughout uh, Parliament buildings and online. And I advise those who are in the public gallery uh, that you're welcome to use mobile devices as long as they're in airplane mode and all devices are muted. And you can connect, you can connect to the Assembly Wi Fi. Details of passwords are uh, on the gallery rules, which you can find on the public gallery. It's not permitted to photograph or record uh, any of the meeting. Um, the Minister uh, can only stay for um, 50 minutes, um, therefore, uh, can we seek agreement to move to uh, Agenda 3 to facilitate this? Yep. Yeah, and officials will remain on to answer any uh, additional questions you may have. Um, I want to refer to you to the um, ministerial brief at pages 21 to 45 of your pack uh, and the paper from the clerk at pages 3 to 9 of the tabled papers there today. And I'd like to take the opportunity to welcome uh, Minister Puch uh, here uh, this morning, and uh, along with himself, uh, Dr. Dennis McMahon, who is the Permanent Secretary, uh, Mr. Norman Fulton, the Deputy Secretary, Head of Food and Farming, and uh, David Small, Grade 3, Head of EMFG, and the Chief Executive of uh, uh, NIEA. And I'd like to take this opportunity now to invite Minister Puch to uh, brief the committee. Okay, thank you very much, Chair, and thanks, Committee. Um, thanks especially for agreeing this morning to have the session restricted a little bit in time. Um, very sadly, a, a very close friend of my, my son's uh, was killed on, on the roads last, last week, 29 years of age, and uh, the funerals this morning, so I appreciate um, having the opportunity to, to be able to go to that. Um, to just say, if you want me back next week, very happy to come back next week, or at the earliest convenience, if there's issues that you want covered. If he doesn't cover it in enough detail, um, I suspect it will not get enough time over 15 minutes to, to, to cover everything that we wish to. Um, I'm in your hands, and uh, my availability to the committee will be my first priority in terms of this, this assembly. Um, you're the first call, and we'll try and avoid organising things on Thursday, Thursday mornings. Um, to, to leave time for the committee, and uh, <coughs> if you give us any notice at all, we'll, we, we'll seek to facilitate you. And what could you do? Because I've sat, or you've sat, and uh, I appreciate the role that you do, <coughs> the legislative role that you do, the scrutineering role that you do, and it's an important role. And I don't see the committee as being an enemy. I see the committee as being another set of eyes because I've only one person. And I have to keep an eye on all of these characters here. And uh, whilst they're, 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 they're good people, um, sometimes there's things which we just don't get quite right. So having a decent eyes to, to, to bring us into check sometimes uh, will be a good thing. And I view that positively, uh, not negatively. I thank the committee for the opportunity to share with you my priorities. And could also thank you for your urgent consideration of the direct payments continuity bill and uh, there will be some other LCMs coming up in due course and I hope that we'll be able to give you adequate and appropriate notice of those uh, to allow those things to, to move in, in the proper way. Also express my thanks for dealing with the backlog and the statutory rules and uh, I know that was quite a, a lengthy piece of work to have to engage in so quickly. And again, my senior officials will be available at any future meeting that, that you request. Then we'll ensure that they'll be made available to you. So if we can just um, run quickly through what uh, priorities um, we would have. And <coughs> I issued the, the, the first day brief that I received. I trust that you all have that now. And uh, obviously climate change was something that came very high on the, on the agenda uh, as it came in. And there certainly has been a lot of public commentary about that. Um, we see a lot of things happening around the world. And we look at what needs to be done here in Northern Ireland. And we need to reduce our carbon footprint. And that's a course of work that needs to be done across a whole series of sector sectors. Actually, in the energy sector, we have made substantial progress. And we are way ahead of the, the rest of um, the UK when it comes to renewable energies, that's something that we should do, do very positively. 
we have made good progress on uh, recycling, but I think that there is much more to be driven out of recycling. And as we get into a debate about how we dispose of the rest of waste, and obviously there is the issue about incineration, um, that's a matter where we need to delve quite deeply into uh, to ensure that we get that right. Because things move, and over the course of the last 10 years, th things have moved and technologies have, have, have changed and adapted. And personally, I believe that there is greater opportunity for further recycling, considerable recycling. So, in all of that there, those are decisions that will have to be made, uh, which will help us in, in dealing uh, with a good environmental practice, with reducing our, our carbon footprint. I do hope to do something very significant on afforestation, as I believe that we need to, as far as possible, uh, be sequestrating um, the carbon that is produced. And if there's means of doing that, um, then we should be doing that. And uh, we believe that each tree that, that's planted over its lifetime will uh, absorb around half a ton of carbon. So we can plant significant numbers of trees and um, that will be something which will be beneficial to our environment and also make this a better place to live. In terms of Brexit, um, we obviously have many challenges ahead, there's many uncertainties, and I will be engaging in the interministerial group and with the appropriate ministers and officials uh, to fight our corner and, and to ensure that we get the best deal possible for people living, living here. So we can improve uh, things uh, for people and get better outcomes than would otherwise be the case, uh, particularly in the absence of devolution. Um, in terms of ammonia, that is going to be a, a considerable and a key issue. Um, Northern Ireland farming has been something which has, has grown over, over the, the years, and the consequence of that is that there's more ammonia um, produced. But um, how can we manage that? So I was at Greenmount um, earlier this week. For example, the dairy unit that they put in, and not every farmer will be putting the same dairy unit in because it's, it was hugely expensive. Um, but their ammonia um, was actually reduced by some 60%. So it's what steps can be encouraged? What's, what's are the ones um, which would be achievable, easiest? Um, to reduce ammonia coming from the dairy sector. Um, uh, same when it comes to the chicken sector. Uh, how can we actually reduce ammonia there? Ironically, uh, m most of us will probably be have a preference for free-range chickens as opposed to chickens which are housed. The chickens which are housed release less ammonia than the free-range ones. Um, however, that's not a route that we, we wish to go down. Um, so we need to be looking at how can we actually <coughs> do that better and ensure that we continue to reduce, reduce uh, ammonia that, that is getting into the atmosphere, and that's going to be a big challenge to us. Um, and I think we can take useful steps in moving things in the right way uh, in terms of, of, of farming in that front. One of the areas, for example, um, where we can make significant reductions is in the slurry spray. So obviously, slurry is a byproduct of, of farming. It's also a val valuable nutrient, um, so it contains many um, quality nutrients, which you would otherwise have to buy. Uh, by spreading with splash plates, you lose an element of those nutrients, um, but also it's, it, it, it allows more methane and, um, to get into the environment and ammonia. So, trailing shoe mechanisms is, is um, technology that has been advanced over the course of the last number of years. And we will want to encourage farming to go down that route and support farming um, to go down that route because they will get a benefit in that more nutrients will get into the, the ground as opposed to the cost. Um, it would mean lead to them buying less fertilizer. But more importantly, um, there's considerably less uh, uh, methane and, and ammonia going into the, the environment. So I want to look for these win wins. We need to have sustainability going forward. So whether that's sustainable environment, um, sustainable farms, sustainable food production, sustainability is going to be a key focus of my time in this ministry and identifying ways 
uh, where we have that sustainability um, that goes across all of the services that we provide. We want sustainable rural communities, and uh, that is absolutely key. Bovine TB is uh, an issue that we really need to get on top of. Um, to say the definition of madness is to keep doing <coughs> the same thing and expect different results. <laughs> Regrettably, um, we have pretty much been doing the same thing for many years, and TB has been growing and growing and growing. It is now a factor in exporting uh, our beef, and some countries don't want our beef because uh, of the high levels of TB. For example, China. That's a very foolish thing, uh, situation to be in. We're also spending £40 million, pounds, roughly, public money each year, um, dealing with the problem, but we're not dealing with the problem. So we can't turn this around overnight, but we can make a significant change. Uh, we can improve the, the health of our cattle population, our bovine population, and we can also improve the health of our wildlife population at the same time and make massive reductions uh, in TB. That's a challenge for us all, and uh, it's an issue that we need to get our heads around. Farm profitability is um, down, down 25 per cent this year, and uh, I think that is entirely uh, inappropriate. Farming is a very, very tough job. People work very long hours, and they deserve a return for their money. And regrettably, as you look at it, the, the processors are doing quite well. The supermarkets are doing quite well. Um, so there's not enough money in the system um, to actually make sure the farmers um, get a reasonable return to ensure that sustainability that I talked about, that there's succession coming on, Young people want to come into the farms. There's the ability to invest in the farms and make good investment, uh, which will enhance animal <coughs> welfare, which will enhance the environment and indeed the profitability of the farm. All of those things should be happening. Um, but if supermarkets and processors are gobbling up all of the profits that exist um, in the food industry, then that is to the detriment of the wider public. And I will be challenging on that particular subject. Rural affairs is a critically important part of this because the rural community is not just about farming community, <coughs> it goes far beyond the farming community. And there's many people living um, in rural communities um, who need additional support and help. Broadband has been a big issue over the years. Um, the, 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 lack, the lack of uh, access to broadband, and that is currently a course of work that is being done. And uh, I would hope that in the not too distant future, um, the, the project uh, to spend £150 million in rural broadband uh, will be able to move ahead and a selected company uh, will be able to, to um, start and, and provide that broadband uh, to many people who don't have it. That's only one of the issues. Um, rural isolation, loneliness, um, people who um, have trouble accessing services that they need, um, such as um, doctors and educational services and so forth. All of those are issues which we will have to deal with. Um, I'm the east of the province. It's not, not, not as bad where we are, but I recognise that there are issues in the west of the province um, where you have a lot longer distances to travel, poor public transport and all of that. And we all have ideas about how to, how to respond to those things. And it's how we can make best use of the money that we have available to us uh, to actually make the biggest impact on people's lives. So that's a very quick dash through the sorts of issues um, that, that, that are before us. And uh, I'm happy to take questions, Mr Chairman. Um, I want to thank the Minister for that very comprehensive briefing and, and also thank you for being here this morning, given the, the, the tragic nature of what happened in your area and the fact that you have to you're heading off to the, the funeral this morning. Um, obviously, there's members have uh, indicated that they want to speak um, and um, a number of members on the list here, so I'll, we'll try to get as many people in sure. before you, you, you leave. Uh, I suppose, Minister, from my own point of view, um, I want to ask you a question that has been a, a, probably the most salient issue that has been raised with me uh, most recently, and it relates to um, you know some of the, the comments that you, you, you've made since becoming minister and in the chamber 
last week around what the shape of a future agriculture policy might mean. Um, I've been contacted by quite a number of um, beef and sheep farmers in the, the LFA ANC areas who are concerned at what they see as your preference to move away from an area-based approach to support of farmers. Uh, your comments around the um, stopping the transition towards the flat rate and also the fact this is all compounded by the fact that they, the ANC payment support payment has been withdrawn whilst it actually has been increased uh, in other parts of the EU and in the south of Ireland. So I suppose what I would like to tease out from yourself, what, what would you say to those farmers in the LFA ANC areas to alleviate some of the probably the concerns which they have right now? Yeah. I think the problems that I alluded to in terms of you know how tough farming can be um, how long hours are, are, are worked for, for very modest profitability are probably exacerbated when you get to the hills. So it was tough on the lowlands to, to, to get a living, it's even tougher on the hills. So I recognise that and I appreciate it. And I am not coming in here to be a basher of hill farmers, far from it. I want hill farmers to be profitable. Um, I also want hill farmers to play a key role in a quality of food chain. Because if you're looking at, you know, really good quality food, what's produced on the hills is amongst the most natural food you'll get anywhere in the world. Right? We can't grow vegetables in the hills, and you can't grow cereals in the hills. You're very limited of what you what you can do on the hills. And growing grass is is, is the, the thing that largely you can do. And so you're obviously going to be livestock farmers. So I want to ensure that their, their part of that system is a profitable part of the system, um, but they're produces, producing the best quality livestock, because they do, um, which will come down to the lowlands for finishing, and therefore moving towards you know, suckler cow support and to sheep support is two courses that I particularly want to see happening on the hills, um, because I don't want our beef herd to be reliant on dairy calves, you know, beef from the dairy herd. <coughs> I want quality of material coming from the hills, um, you know, quality of um, beef cattle coming from the hills, um, which will then make, you know, our, our beef that we're selling across the world as the best quality anywhere. And I believe the little <coughs> farmers have a key role in doing that. So I'm very happy to, to talk to to. to to go to Fermanagh and Tyrone and North Antrim and, and, and those places which, which parts of County Down which, which have more, more, more hilly regions and the less favoured areas and uh, talk, talk to the people there about what they want to see, about what I want to see because I don't think that ultimately we're, we're, we're that far apart and um, people always, always have hesitation about changing the systems um, but ultimately I think we both have the same aim, and that is to have prof profitable farms, whether it be in the hills or the lowlands. Uh, thank you, Fed Minister. I'm, I'm glad uh, that you, you recognise those challenges. Um, but obviously, under the, the current system, farmers are um, incentivised to maintain their lands in good agricultural and environmental condition. And obviously, there's the greening element of the single farm payment. Do you not feel that perhaps that the approach that you might take would um, be challenging to meet the environmental targets and environmental protection if, if, if the focus is going to be on productivity and perhaps not incentivising farmers, which as they are now, to be uh, managers and custodians of their land from an environmental perspective, in which they are doing very, very well? I think anything that we do will, will be promoting both animal welfare and environment, and those will all be key factors. So production, animal welfare and environment will lead to a successful economy. Um, because if we if we produce um, less cattle and less sheep and, and less dairy products, then that's less jobs in the processing sector, where many people from rural communities are actually working in. So we want to have um, a system which is productive and, and which works well. And I would say this: there are quite a number of anomalies. So you have airports, um, prisons, um, and uh, other estates which are claiming single farm payment but aren't, aren't you know, they're clearly not farms. Um, but because they own the land, 
and people are coming in and taking a, a couple of cups of grass and things off them, you know, just to, to, to tidy it up and to clean it up. My view is that we should be much more focused on actually farming and ensure that, that the, the money that is being paid, um, because it's, 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 a, it's a significant pot of money, but it's not going to get any larger. It's, it's £293 million, pounds, so it's very significant. Um, but I want to make the best utilisation of that and ensuring that we have a sustainable agriculture going forward. And that is something which is, is um, capable of actually developing, um, being profitable and um, meeting all of the requirements that we will set for it in terms of the environment and animal welfare. Um, thanks, Minister. And I, I don't, there's many other questions I could ask, but I don't um, want to hug. I don't want to hug it. Well, we've plenty of time o o over the coming weeks. If we want to spend a day on this, <laughs> I'm happy to spend the day on yeah, it. I'm conscious of the one that everybody in that wants to, yeah. has to indicate here. Uh, Philip, you've indicated. Uh, uh, welcome, Minister, and thanks for your opening comments, and, and also thanks for your comments in relation to... Uh, the importance that and the role of, of the committee and how you see uh, that working out over a future months. Uh, and thanks for your comments in relation to the question of the chair and your your a certain tie down to coming down to North Antrim to speak to the farmers there. No problem. Uh, so we can discuss how we see that moving forward. The first item on your new day brief is climate change, and climate yeah. change is obviously. Uh, undoubtedly at the forefront of public concern uh, and I welcome the commitments in the new decade, new approach document uh, that the executive uh, will take towards uh, dealing with that issue and trying to address some of, of the, 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 the problems of, of climate change and environmental protection legislation. And could I just ask you then, uh, as the Minister overseeing environment, you know, when you uh, intend to take that, or how you intend to take that issue forward? I'm, I'm talking specifically about the Climate Change Act and uh, the Independent Environmental Protection Agency. So, I mean, if you could maybe outline for us a timetable uh, and you know when this committee will begin to see actions and get to scrutinise some of the suggestions and proposals that you intend to take forward to see both those things come to fruition. Yeah. It's, it's early days and consequently I haven't got a timetable for it, um, but in terms of it, we are closely looking and, and, and our team is closely looking at the opportunities that exist. So there's also an Office of Environmental Protection that has been set up in, 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 at Westminster um, the, looking at the independent EPA looking at the current service that is provided by the NIEA. Um, all of those in terms of that actual management process is, is, is something that we will need to come to a decision on relatively quickly um, because we have a lot of work to do and we've got basically two years to do it. We're sitting here in two years' time. We won't have time to introduce new legislation. At that point, we'll be tidying up um, the tail of, of legislation um, as we approach an election. So we need to, we need to identify the, the, the way forward and, and, and chart the way forward and get that timetable uh, relatively quickly uh, in terms of that course of work. None of that um, stops us actually working on reducing our carbon footprint and identifying means of reducing our carbon footprint. So previously when I was in Department of Environment, um, we went ahead with setting up the electric points for, for charging cars, which there was precious few electric cars at that stage. Um, but there is a course of work that needs to be looked at. Um, so we're producing 37% of our energy from renewable sources, so actually having electric cars does make sense here. We're in Germany, where nearly 40% of their electric is produced from coal. An electric car might actually be detrimental, it might be actually work using fuels which are, are worse for the environment um, than petrol or diesel in that instance, but it makes sense here. And we have a target um, for stopping producing uh, petrol and diesel cars, so that's a course of work that we could be doing. Now, I know that 
in the south of Ireland, they, they have entered into a partnership with the business, um, uh, one of the electric businesses, um, who are paying a substantial part of it. Thus far, we have paid it all from government sources, as I understand. So those are courses of work that we can do in terms of reducing <coughs> carbon footprint. Going ahead with afforestation and doing something significant on afforestation is something that we can do to reduce the carbon footprint. Ensuring that agriculture um, is encouraged and indeed incentivised um, to, to be doing, doing their business in a way uh, which reduces um, the release of methane and ammonia and, uh, and, and, and those things will reduce the carbon footprint. Uh, and there are so much more that we can do um, with industry um, and transport and all of that there to reduce the carbon footprint. So that course of work needs to be done in any event, irrespective of NIA, Independent EPA, Office of, of, of Protection, Environmental Protection. We need to be working towards that. <coughs> and that's a course of work that my officials are engaging in, uh, even at this point. I mean, just a wee Thanks quick, I mean, obviously uh, I welcome the, the work that's ongoing and, and it is important, uh, but so uh, is the importance of tying it all down together through the Climate Change Act. I mean, you made the point that uh, there's only two years left uh, in this term, uh, but I mean, the, the damage to your environment isn't waiting for um, parliamentary terms or elections. No. You know, that, 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 that damage is continuing. So, I mean, are, are you given a commitment that there will be... Uh, a climate change act in the in the course of the next two years. It is our intention to do that, yes. But um, what I'm saying is, the environment's not waiting for the climate change act either. Yeah. You know, we, we we should be taking actions and engaging <coughs> in actions, um, which is reducing our carbon footprint, um, irrespective of, of of any legislation or, or oversight. That's a course of work that needs to be carried on, and and, and we'll be doing that. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Philip. John. Um, Chairperson, thank the, the Minister for his introduction. I, I was looking forward to the climate change debate, which was moved to next week, and unfortunately coincides with the hospital appointment, so my absence is not lack of interest. But let me say at the outset, I wish to pay tribute to Dr Dennis McMahon, the Permanent Secretary, who, in uh, the absence of an Assembly, I think did amazing work on much of the material that we're discussing this morning. Minister... The local government planning uh, committees have a critical role to play in the future, and I know that many of them are inundated uh, with uh, planning applications for what some people describe as intensive factory farming units that in the past have not been subject to environmental assessment, habitat regulations, and I think uh, other statutory um, requirements. Uh, 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 what steps does the, the Minister intend to take to ensure that the good work he has outlined for his department, in fact, is not running contrary to what might be happening in local planning committees in the 11 councils, where we may well be uh, cultivating uh, uh, the development of projects that in themselves are raising am ammonia and nitrates uh, to, to levels that are well beyond which are acceptable to, to, to us all. And I don't say that as, as, as being anti-farm. I am pleased that the, the Minister has told us that he wants to work with the farming community. And I welcome recent announcements from the Ulster Farmers Union that they intend to do that. But uh, I suppose, uh, uh, to, to shorten my question, uh, is the Minister concerned that there needs to be a, a link between his department and uh, the local planners and what is best for everybody? Okay, well, thank you for that and wish you well with uh, your ongoing um, thank treatment you. and care and uh, hope that uh, you recover uh, to full health once again. In terms of it, um, one of your actual co co colleagues previously set up a group called SES, mm -hmm. Specialist in Environmental Services, sure. um, who are the key, key point for consultation with the local authorities, um, who are actually independent of our department. 
and uh, they provide considerable advice to that. The Department itself screens applications based on the, the zones of influence. So agricultural developments that are within seven and a half kilometres of designated sites, that is special areas of conservation, special protection areas, uh, ASSIs and Ramsar sites, and two kilometres from priority habitats. Where a proposed development has an estimated process contribution of uh, less than one percent of the critical level at which damage occurs to sensitive sites, if adjacent designated sites, it will be screened out as not significant. Um, but where critical levels of ammonia at a protected site have been exceeded, then additional ammonia emissions of up to ten percent of the critical level for that site from the proposed developments within contributions that is one percent or over of the critical level are permitted. So the additional cumulative loading is calculated from a pre-going for growth baseline on the 1st of January 2012, and the discretionary allowance of 10% is solely based on the critical level for the site. And as an addition to the existing background exceedance, and it should be noted that the current approach does not take account of the significant uh, background exceedances. Um, that's also something that, that we are reviewing. And uh, we will come back to yourselves um, whenever we have, have completed that. I should say that some of the applications that are coming forward, particularly in the pig sector, where they are replacing older buildings, sometimes they'll be increasing the, 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 the numbers on the unit, um, but they're getting rid of a lot of the older buildings. That isn't necessarily a bad thing. And a lot of those older buildings are, are not fit for purpose and are not good um, in terms of, of the whole issue about ammonia. Um, I suppose when we, when we look at, at the opportunities, separation of um, the faeces from, from, from the urine, um, that's where those two things co-join co and creates a lot of the ammonia. So an early separation of those is something which would be hugely beneficial in terms of reducing ammonia. Storage and cap tanks um, is something, again, uh, which uh, is hugely beneficial. And then, of course, the spreading off it with the trailing shoes uh, and, and double bars as opposed to um, the, 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 the older methods um, also is, is, has about a 30% reduction. Um, so the technology now exists. We now know ammonia is a problem. We have known it for a number of years, but, but, but we have a technology there that will reduce the amount of ammonia coming from farms, and that's of course a thing that we need to encourage farmers down. Yeah. Chairman, just supplementary to that, uh, much of the uh, effluent that's produced by the agro digester units uh, is exported to uh, uh, a plant in Donegal, which I believe is assembly partly funded. Given that we're just 24 hours away from leaving the EU, are we uh, guaranteed that that practice will continue? Um, that would be for the uh, chicken, chicken litter waste. And the chicken litter has uh, is something which would have very high, high ammonia levels. And, yeah. Uh, quite a lot of that has been sp spread and immediately, and immediately plowed in, which, which um, needs, needs to happen in, in terms of, of, of reducing its impact. Um, ultimately, we would need to find a better way of, of, of dealing with chicken litter. And there was a previous proposal to, to incinerate that yes. at Crumlin, which uh, didn't go ahead. Um, there's issues about that. I, I personally think that there are opportunities for collaboration between other people in waste sure. um, to work with the chicken industry uh, in <coughs> identifying solutions. Um, because it has very high calorific value in terms of, of, of burning and producing energy. Um, and the, the, the scrubbers that can be put in the chimneys and so forth can take an awful lot of emissions out. And probably the most environmentally friendly way of doing it is, is to do it that way. Mm -hmm. The anaerobic digesters do not particularly like chicken litter. Um, I know they're using it in that one in Donegal because it is very, very sore on, on the actual equipment. Um, because of the ammonia, sure. so uh, you need to replace the equipment, um, uh, parts of the equipment quite often, so it can be a quite an expensive um, issue. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I want to just uh, get, get
Get everyone in here. Um, Ro Rosemary, you're next on this. Good job. Thank you. Thank you, Minister, for your brief this morning. And you're also very welcome to Fermanagh and South Throne when you get the time. Oh, sorry, I yesterday. know you were there yesterday. I, under I understand you were, but I'll invite you back to meet some farmers. Absolutely. Have a good day. <laughs> Podcast. Thank you. Um, just one f one follow on from the last the last speaker. That were, that's in relation to obviously from Anna South Throne border constituency. Um, how much collaboration is there between the depart the departments of agriculture, environment, etc. here and in the south? In, and that's in relation to you know the setting up p poultry units, etc. Because you have ammonia and Different levels, different rates acceptable in on both sides of the border. So is there is there collaboration there? Okay, I'll pass that one to the. Well, I mean, there's collaboration at a range of levels. I mean, uh, you'll have already got a sense from Robert. I think Robert's been up in front of you. Yes. Um, <laughs> Chief Veterinary Officer and Robert deals very closely with his colleagues around animal uh, disease issues and animal welfare issues. Um, obviously, in the context of Brexit and all of the discussions around trade, we've had a lot of and the various sort of um, scenarios that have panned out over the last year. Uh, we have been working very closely with colleagues in Daffin to understand what's going to happen, for example, around things like export health certificates at one stage was a big issue. Um, and we, we do have a, we have a good working relationship, as you'd expect. Um, around a whole range of issues, including some of the ones that you've mentioned. I, I would say, I suppose, uh, the, um, certainly the, we, we try to learn as much as we can from each other and from other administrations as well, and that, that tends to be a very useful process, which the Minister is very happy to support because it's, it's about good practice. And similar planning regulations, I take it, when they're setting up the, setting up maybe setting up poultry units? Well, I'm happy to open that up if, if there's anything you yeah. want to add, David, on that I'm not, specific I'm not sure point. The, the, the planning systems are, are independent of, of each other, so yeah. you know they they won't be uh, total, totally uh, the same on, on every every element. The, the, they're slightly different policies, I suppose, north and south. But we we have had good discussions and engagement with colleagues in the south, uh, specific, specifically around the ammonia challenges. Mm -hmm. So the ammonia uh, problems that we're facing here are also being addressed in, in the south. And I know colleagues in the south are, are, are doing what we're doing here, looking at the kind of uh, solutions that the minister has outlined in terms of what could be put in place to help the industry reduce its ammonia emissions. Uh, and on the issue of planning, as I say, the, the planning systems are independent, um, but certainly in Northern Ireland, the planning committees act as competent authorities. and. When they make planning decisions, you know, on, on any kind of, of development, but including agricultural and intensive agriculture development, they need to take account of all all the relevant uh, <coughs> obligations that we have under EU law, EU directive, and so on. Uh, we we do have an advisory role as a statutory consultee, and we will offer our comments in terms of whether we believe uh, a development could have an adverse impact on the environment. But it is ultimately for the planning committee, as a competent authority, to make the final decision. Okay, thank thank you. you. And just, um, just uh, my main question, it's to do with agricultural appe the appeals process. Mm -hmm. you, ha you have at the moment, a uh, farmer takes his case to the agricultural appe uh, appeals process, and you have an independent panel making a judgment. And very often that judgment then is overturned by the department. The department have the final say, and I think... Um, that's very disappointing for the farmer, particularly when a judgment has been given by an independent panel to have it overturned. So, where, in other words, where's the point in the appeals process if it's going to be overturned back to the original? I, I hear what you're saying, and it's something that I have um, been grieved about previously, so it's something that I'm happy to look at. Um, I think if you, if you give someone responsibility to look at an issue independently and then you, you just ignore it. Uh, it's yeah. either for the people who sit on the panel or indeed the, the, the applicant. Um, it, it doesn't inspire much confidence on either side or, or encouragement uh, to engage in a process because it comes somewhat meaningless at that point, so we'll look at that. Okay, thank you. All right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister, for being here. And good to meet the Permanent Secretary as well. Hello. Um, I know your time's 
um, tight and do under the circumstances with your tragic family loss. Thank you again for being here. I want to maybe pick up on, I'm quite new to this committee, to the department brief, and um, it is huge, mm -hmm. it is far reaching, and I maybe just want to ask you in the context of that this is so wide and it's cross-cutting in terms of how it impacts with other departments, um, and we are almost 24 hours <coughs> from Brexit and Brexit and the workload that that will impact yeah. on your department, I am sure will be huge as well. Do you feel that you've got the necessary resource and also the buy-in at executive level or cross-departmental working to deal with the, the amount of change this could potentially see for the department? Well, I, I never have enough resource and I'm sure we could spend twice as much money as we currently do, to be honest. Even in human resource as well, do you know all of it? Well, um, I'll, I'll, I'll let De Dennis be, be the judge of the human resource, but uh, you know we love to be fight, fighting with other departments or corner to, to get what we can. But health and education are going to be the the, the departments will swallow up uh, so much of the resource. Uh, it leaves relatively little for a small department <coughs> um, financially. Not a small department in terms of responsibility, but in, in terms of its finances, um, it leaves relatively little for for us and. We could do so much more had we had we considerably greater resource, and that'll be the challenge as to how do we get you know, maximum for, 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 for what what we do do um, have uh, to spend. So, Dennis, if you want to talk about uh, this, the resource within the department and how satisfied you are with that in terms of personnel. Well, like, as, as you say, Minister, there's always room for more. We, we have um, 3,100 people in the department, and they, we do a very, very wide range of roles, right from high-level high strategy right through to detailed operational work on the ground. Um, and a chunk of the, the a, a lot of, or a percentage of that is paid for through direct Brexit funding. So, for example, last year it was 12.5 million. And, um, and, a, and then a further 1.4 million for um, associated uh, expenses. Now, the issue then, and, and that's going to grow this year, so we're looking at really 405 people on specific Brexit posts. But that's slightly misleading if you just take that on its own. So, for example, um, myself and the team here today wouldn't be counted in those numbers. And yet, I can assure you, over the last year, we've spent a lot of time Brexit issues. Um, another way of looking at it is the, um, our sister department in GB, DEFRA. Now, again, a different department, different function, so I don't want to take it too far. But I mean, I think they started out smaller than us at 2,500 people and are now sitting moving up to 4,000. So it gives you a sense of the scale. Now, they're involved in negotiations at a level we're not and different things like that, although we <coughs> inform a lot of that. So it's hard to make it. So, so I suppose it gives you a sense of the scale of the challenge for us. Um, and just to pay tribute to colleagues who, who have really worked hard and gone above and beyond the Call of Duty um, over the last year um, and will no doubt continue to. Um, but I think then over and above that, there's issues around making sure that we're getting replacement source, sources of funding as well, um, you know, uh, coming out of, on the back of Brexit um, from the UK government. And then obviously within the remit, um of this department is the environment and just given the climate emergency and what we're facing there what type of departmental budget is set aside to deal with the mitigation measures that we need to be implementing so, so again um there's again one of the things i would say is we we have i'll give you an example of we would get together as a senior management team once a month um the entire senior management team 25 people and we've had two full days on the issue of climate um, so we're looking at this right across the full range of our work. So, for example, our state's transformation team are looking at this to say, how can we <coughs> good practice? And then we've got the people who are doing the coordination work across departments. There's a division there. Um, and then there's others, people like, for example, um, Norman's working on the uh, agri-food policy. And how do we make sure that we're mainstreaming environmental sustainability in line with the minister's desires through that? So all of that work, in a sense, the whole department's work will be pulled into this because I suppose we're looking at, and the minister's looking at it from the point of view of sustainability. So um, this is about actually using this to do good business practice mm -hmm. because actually it's not a win-win. It's, it's not an either-or. If we'll get it right. 
If we get right, absolutely. And there's a huge amount of challenge in that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Until we uh, move across here, we're conscious we've only five minutes left for your time, Minister. Um, Harry. Thank you, <coughs> Chair. Thank you, Minister. appreciate your attendance here today. A wee question just on bovine tuberculosis. Um, <coughs> maybe you could tell me, Minister, what's the rate of infection in Northern Ireland compared to other jurisdictions? I know in my area, I mean, there are hot spots and total wipeouts have occurred. It's uh, just short of 8%, and um, Ireland it's, it's around 4%, and indeed most of GB, I think Scotland's down to less than 3 mm. So we are way above any other region. Um, and the research has been done, the science exists. Um, we have a higher population of, of badgers in Northern Ireland than any other parts. And in a number of areas, unfortunately, that badger population has become heavily infected with tuberculosis. Now, that is not the case for all badgers, and therefore I would be opposed to a full-scale cull of badgers um, across Northern Ireland. But I do think that we will have to look at where those hotspots are and where the veterinary science indicates that the tuberculosis has been derived from the badgers, to actually go and spend hundreds of thousands clearing out a, 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 a significant herd of cattle, you know, keeping that, that place dormant for a period of time, moving the cattle back in without doing anything about where the tuberculosis arrived from in the first instance, is just a nonsense that we have been engaging in for a long time. And consequently, we will need to do something. And <coughs> personally speaking, you know, we we have badgers at home, and I have no issues whatsoever because we we, we don't believe that we have ever contracted um, tuberculosis from them. Um, so I think that it's an area where it needs to be very focused in terms of what's done. But for the badger population itself. I believe that um, culling where, 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 where the hotspots exist and then vaccinating on the perimeter of the hotspots um, will help us to have a much healthier wildlife population and indeed a much healthier bovine population going forward. Um, but to, to not do anything, to me, is, is a huge waste of public money. The mental stress that it's causing for many people who are on the farms, because people have built up bloodlines and, and have bills to pay and, and, and business issues. It's all right getting comp compensated for, for your cows, but if you're not able to earn any money for six months and you, you, you're maybe sitting with uh, a six or seven figure um, debt to service, it's uh, a desperately difficult place to be. Um, so the mental stress that's causing uh, in the community is, is, is quite incredible. Um, so we do need to do better um, than what is currently the case. Yep. Okay, thank you, Chair. Just uh, Andrew, uh, I'm glad to hear that the issue is being addressed in what would seem to be a sensible and calculated manner. Because, I mean, the big worry is um, <coughs> severe mental health and depression of those involved. So thank you, Minister. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Morris? Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I welcome Minister and congratulations on your appointment and thanks for taking the time to be here. Uh, what I'd like to ask is something that I know is a pet project of your own anyway, and that's the forest extension policy. And you have down here uh, to increase from 8% to 12%, but it's a 30-year programme. Is that is that a high enough target? No, it's not. I'm going to make a higher target. That's, that, that was a civil service target. I have a higher, higher target Good. than that. So, okay. so the answer is no, it's not enough. Yeah. Can I ask a... Yeah, just as a, as a supplementary, is there any opportunity to work with other departments to increase tree planting? Absolutely. I'll give you an example. I drove up here this morning, and others do as well, on a motorway, bereft of trees. So and I noticed in Germany that all the motorways are lined with broadleaf trees, factories are screened, broadleaf trees, schools are screened, broadleaf trees, industrial areas, broadleaf trees. None of that happens here. Yeah. 
We're writing to all of the departments and asking them to contact their um, arms length bodies um, in terms of the provision of land uh, because for many years one of the things that's been holding us back is um, we have a, a, a very large estate um, in terms of, of DERA and, and its land holdings but to go out and buy land to plant trees is an excessive cost and therefore we need to utilise better the land that's currently available so I know that <coughs> there's health trusts there with large volumes of land, there's sectors of education, local authorities, a whole range of groups of people out there who own land, um, who are in the public sector, and we want to utilise that land uh, for forestation. We also want to encourage private landowners, and you know, I would like to look again at um, riparian border, uh, borders, so where you have rivers, um, farmers, for example, not supposed to be spreading slurry close to those rivers um, and it shouldn't be nutrient rich so why not uh, uh, take the opportunity of, of planting trees along part of it where, where you're going to be guaranteed then that there's no nutrients getting into the rivers so you can actually plant trees with, with, which, which, which helps in one way um, but it also helps in two ways because at that stage you're um, ensuring that you have cleaner water system as well and you know, tr tr trees are huge absorbers of water as well, so riverside locations are, are very good for it. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Minister. I look forward to your new targets. Would you have time, Minister, for a quick oh, one oh, from your I couldn't, colleague? I couldn't not answer Mr. <laughs> Irwin. <laughs> and thank you, and thank you, Minister, for attending the committee today. In relation to ammonia, we all realise that ammonia levels in Northern Ireland are, are high. We realise that if it's not dealt with, it could be detrimental to the future expansion and future of the industry. Uh, there are new technologies that can deal with this, and I think it's very important that those technologies. Uh, I want to ask the minister if he's looking at those technologies, which I'm sure he is. But also very important that there's uh, support given. Uh, some of these technologies are quite expensive. Yeah. And it's quite important that the support given to the industry to try and um, deal with this. Uh, I, it, it, there, there, it is possible to deal with it, and I think it's important that there's no time wasted in moving forward on this issue. I just want insurance from the minister that this will happen. Absolutely, and uh, we, we, we are looking at those technologies and, and um, <coughs> that we should be offering incentivisation. Um, Obviously, again, that's depending on what's money we have, but incentivisation, um, so that we can hasten and, and actually accelerate uh, the impact that we have, because we can we can set up rules and so forth going going forward, but that'll be a very slow process because anybody who's already got an existing facility um, won't be incentivised um, to to do much. Um, so it'll only be those who are, who are building afresh. So we do need to create incentives, incentives um, for that going forward. I should say, and um, it, it is bad criticism for obvious reasons, um, but the Renewable Health, our Renewable Heat Initiative, was actually good for ammonia. And the chicken farms that were using the Renewable Heat Initiative um, had a much drier heat and there was less ammonia in those facilities. Uh, than where the gas uh, heat is used and <coughs> consequently there had been progress made on that and that has been rolled back because of the decision that um, was taken by DFE officials last year uh, to reduce the, the, the payment um, from what had been set by the Assembly here. Um, which was less than the payment that's made in England, less than the payment that's made in Ireland. Um, but they reduced that further. And as a consequence, that as many people have moved away from uh, using the wood boilers and have went back, reverted back to gas. Um, that has been a, a detrimental step in terms of the environment. Uh, so, you know, we need to be, be looking at how we can ensure that, you know, if, if we start to make progress in these things, that we drive it forward and don't have to go backwards. Okay. But, um, 
holding the minister back and on the TB issue, and I make the clear and discuss uh, Aaron for some shared at home, uh, we have an issue with TB. Um, I'm aware just recently there's some new test uh, identified in England that uh, seemingly uh, is very positive in, in taking out all the reactors. Um, would the minister uh, be prepared to look at new technologies or new tests to see? The test we have today is not perfect, and of course it only takes out something like 75% of reactors. Yeah. And the difficulty is the same test or similar test for 50, 60, 70 years. And I think it's important that, that there are, in this day and age, one would have thought uh, that there should be new technology and new tests coming forward to deal with the issue. I'm told there is a new test at the moment, but I just were told that the other night. We'd be very happy to look at that. Um, there is um, latency in terms of um, TB um, residing in, in, in an animal which, which isn't picked up in a test and then uh, is picked up uh, in the future. And you know, I've had personal experience of that. So buying animals from a farm which had TB, which was cleared of TB, and, and consequently those animals um, present with TB at a, at a later point. Um, and that's got nothing whatsoever to do with the wildlife population. So there's no point in seeking to tackle it in, in, in one way. If we're going to tackle TB, we need to tackle it in a series of ways. Um, I'd have to say that there are a very small number, but there are some farmers who are engaging in fraud when it comes to it. Yeah. I believe that we need to be much tougher on those individuals, much tougher on those individuals. And I, I, would, I would prefer that those people actually weren't farming because what they're doing is... It's grossly wrong, and uh, that's, that's an area that we'd be looking at on the fraud side of things. But in terms of the whole testing regime, it's obviously been something which is, um, hasn't changed much over the years. If there are better systems for identifying it, I want to know about it. Uh, and if, if, if we can uh, implement it, so yes. Thank you. Okay, um, I'd like to thank the Minister for his um, contribution this morning and widespread briefing and open yourself up for questions. Um, can I ask at this stage that we take um, a break for a few moments? There's a technical issue with the microphones, uh, but the officials to don't leave the building because <laughs> yeah. we want to pick up on some issues afterwards. So. Can I express my appreciation for the opportunity to come before the committee? And as I say, um, as soon as you're ready, can she shout and we'll really make ourselves available. Um, Thank you, Minister Pitt. Thank you. Thank you. Is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30? This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. Folks, um, following uh, the briefing from the Minister, um, who has, has now headed on there in order to attend that, um, we have the Department Secretary and officials here from the Department with us. And there's been, um, there was a, a very wide ranging briefing from the Minister, which is very appreciated. And no doubt there'll be um, a number of issues which some of you may want to pick up on to drill down a little bit more detail. So, if you want to, uh, anybody wants to indicate, we can take this opportunity now to follow up on issues or ex or even new issues, which uh, which which you might want to pick up on from before. And I suppose perhaps to to get the ball rolling from from my uh, point of view, um, I'd just like to pick it up on the the future agriculture policy again. I'd like to to to. Try to explain how are we going to proceed with this? Are we going to look at primary legislation? Are we going to look at the schedule within the Agriculture Bill in Westminster? And where does this, that comprehensive stakeholder engagement that we engaged in last year, where does that fit in with this new policy? Um, well, I'll maybe make a few general points and then I think Norman can talk through the detail of it. I suppose this um, one of the things that uh, I've certainly learned in the last uh, two years has been how joined up everything is. Um, you'll have seen the paper that was put out for consultation had four key areas, four key themes running through it um, around productivity. I'll probably forget them. Norman can remind me. Productivity, environmental sustainability, um, supply chain integration, um, and resilience. And I suppose the key point is when you start to look at any one of those issues, it fits into one of the others. And I'll give you a real example of that. One of the things we're looking at is how to do a, a, an integrated environmental model to see what the impacts are in terms of carbon, ammonia, but also productivity. So, for example, uh, TB is not just bad for business. It is very bad for business. In addition to that, it's also a waste of resource and, as such, therefore, increases carbon emissions. So... Um, that's by way of saying how all encompassing all of this is, and therefore, back to your original question, this is going to this is going to read out both through a piece of work now that needs to be done on the back of the very extensive consultation, and then going forward into further legislation. This isn't something that will happen in one or two years. There's going to be a development approach over the next uh, number of years. No, anything I've got wrong there, you can feel free to correct and, uh, yeah, and I mean, add to that. I suppose the, uh, the work we did with stakeholders was in effect it was a co-design pro uh, per, uh, process around the future agricultural policy framework. And it was a very high document, high level document, but well received. Uh, I think we had about 1,200 responses to that uh, consultation. Now, um, that's something now that uh, we can actually now check to the Minister in, in terms of this is what stakeholders thought uh, of that framework and, and uh, how do we proceed from, from here. Um, but agriculture, like environment, fisheries, etc., is now fully, these are fully devolved matters. Uh, so the policy comes straight back from Brussels to here. Uh, so we have now that responsibility and opportunity to set uh, our, our own agenda uh, going forward. In terms of how to proceed, uh, I mean, certainly, the agriculture bill uh, going through uh, Westminster uh, contains a North Island schedule, and that will really allow us to, I suppose, do a little bit in terms of uh, rolling forward what we have, simplifying it a bit, um, and, and we can certainly look at that. But anything more fundamental, I think we, we need uh, need to, to look at. You know, what sort of uh, adjustment to primary legislation do we need to take through here, um, and. Uh, 
to inform that, obviously, we need to set the, the, the big direction where we're heading. What are the big fundamental principles we want to, to drive forward? Um, and that whole integration of clean productivity, resilience, environment, sustainability, so all the tools that we need to actually deliver that, uh, that agenda. Uh, and we'll be doing work uh, around all of that. Stakeholder engagement is going to have to be a big part of this uh, because it, it is so fundamental to the future of, uh, of the industry but also the environment uh, and we need to basically bring uh, all the interested parties together uh, to, to shape that agenda and I think we can certainly do that um, and, and we've, we've, we've achieved a good start uh, around the framework document uh, but it's really taken it on from there. This of course is not a once and done. Exercise. Uh, this is a this is a new journey. A journey. Uh, it's an evolution uh, because we now have this policy, uh, so we can take it forward, refine it, develop it, evolve it. Uh, so it's not just something for the next year or two. This is with us now permanently, uh, and therefore we have the opportunity to 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 learn, to refine, uh, to respond to changing circumstances and changing demands. Uh, but that will be our responsibility to do that and our, and our opportunity to do that because it is a fully devolved. And can I ask one more question, Norman? Obviously, regrettably, we are leaving the EU tomorrow. What will happen in the situations down the line where, okay, once we're leaving the EU, we will remain aligned across a whole series of regulations as per the withdrawal agreement? What will happen in situations where that may come into conflict with the, uh, the, the agriculture bill? I don't think it's going to create any issues in terms of the agriculture bill uh, because it, it's really around effectively this is the support framework. An agriculture bill, it's, I mean, it's primarily an English bill. We've yeah. taken a schedule within it to enable us to basically uh, roll forward and, and simplify what we have. Uh, so it doesn't really create any conflict there. I think what the challenge for us that it does make, uh, does create, uh, is of course we're op operating in a competitive uh, environment with uh, with Ireland. Um, we're also selling into GB; it's, it's our main market. So therefore, we sit in that point where we have to really understand, you know, where our industry sits in competitive terms uh, against those other areas, and ensure and ensure that what we do doesn't actually conflict or create distortions, uh, and, and, and that could happen. Uh, so we need, we need to be very alive to that, uh, to make sure that we actually place our industry <coughs> in the best place uh, can be to actually compete on a level playing field. Part of that uh, will be through the agricultural support framework that we put in place, uh, but it won't be the, the, the only element uh, that will, will be important here. But yeah, it, 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 I suppose it just in, increases the extent, the extent of the challenge that we have. Thanks, Norman Pope. Thank you. Just a uh, couple of wee questions on, on two different issues. One, uh, rural broadband. Uh, I, mean, uh, I mean, I understand that it's primarily uh, a role for the Department for the Economy, but I mean, there are 97,000 rural dwellers who currently don't have adequate broadband. I mean, I've often described broadband now as an essential utility in, in the way water, heat and electricity are you know, for a raft of range, ranges. You know, children need good broadband to do their homework. Uh, families need broadband to keep in contact with people. Rural dwellers in particular need good broadband for access to service, whether that be medical, agriculture. You know, majority of uh, farms now uh, within the agricultural sector are filled in. Uh, and it's a major, major issue. So. Um, I suppose my point is the the department is uh, putting additional funding towards that project. I mean, are, are, are you able to use influence, and when do we actually plan to see that work beginning? And this 97,000 rural dwellers uh, having the adequate broadband that they, that they should have. Uh, and then just quickly, in terms of the environmental farming scheme, uh, is, there, is there any update on that? Uh, and will the delay? You know, have any impact on the funding and for farmers? Uh, you know, in terms of time constraints or uh, retrospective funding, etc. Okay. Well, maybe I'll, I'll mention. I'll talk a little bit about Project Stratum, and then maybe uh, David can yeah. come in on the back on the environmental funding scheme. So, um, absolutely, uh, everything you've said, absolutely right. 
Um, rural broadband, absolutely essential. If you think about it, just as the Minister said earlier, of course it's central to the farming community. It's also central to the wider rural community. This is about connectivity and access. And um, we are contributing £15 million to that at the minute. Um, do we have an influence? Of course we have an influence in that, in that sense, but at the minute there's a procurement process going through, so there's a limit to what, what can be said about that. That just has to, that has to take its course. Um, but what is it we're aiming for? Well, we're aiming to get um, as much support for rural communities to remove, to reduce social isolation as far as possible as well. Um, we've shown actually in areas that people thought was impossible, I mean the amount of, for example, 100% online um, you know, applications for uh, single farm payments, an incredible change, which nobody said, nobody thought would have been possible. Not easy and not always, but again, exa an example of what can be done and, uh, and our performance in that is above other parts of uh, other NGV, uh, other parts of the UK. So I suppose, um, what basically to, to, to finish off, to reinforce your point, um, we're really keen to see this happen. Uh, there are great examples elsewhere of where this can actually be transformative. So there's, uh, I think Skibbereen is doing this with the one gigabyte village, um, okay. where they, they've actually really used that as an opportunity to develop a whole new t approach to technology and, and business. Um, so we want to do that through it, so we want it to work. And I know there's always a challenge about how, how you balance the need to get as many people connected as soon as possible with the, the fact that there will be certain connections that will just be that bit harder and that's going to be that's that's going to be a discussion to be had um, but um, our, our aim is really get full coverage as far as we possibly can and uh, do you want to say something yeah. the <coughs> so on the environment reform scheme you know that we had paused <coughs> uh, the the launch of of tranche three and the issue of agreements and, and that was done uh, to ensure that the experience we had seen through tranche one and tranche two in terms of the uptake of, of the various options under the scheme uh, was, was sufficient to, for us to ensure that we were spending money wisely and that we were securing the value for money and the benefits that we had originally uh, intended to get from the scheme. So that, that work in terms of reviewing uh, the scheme has been progressing well. Um, and we have reached a, po a point now where we will be putting a set of clear options to the Minister in terms of how we proceed with tranche 3. And I, I don't really want to get into the detail of, of the nature of those options but because we, we haven't had the opportunity to discuss them yet with the Minister, but they are currently going to the Minister. I, I would hope that we will be in a position to confirm how we proceed on tranche 3 um, very soon, um, but I can't give a timetable for that, but good progress has been made. Thank you. you okay? Uh, uh, Rosemary? Yeah, mine's on the budget. It's looking look, um, look forward to, to 2020-21. You know, what will your main spending priorities be in the incoming budget? <laughs> well, I suppose um, I'll start off and again, my colleagues can come in, and, come in on the back of it. Um, the main thing um, that we spend money on is people, uh, because an awful, in, in terms of our core resource, obviously there's European funding, and then there'll be whatever UK, Europe, you know, funding comes along with that. So, I mean, looking ahead, if you if you take a look at the sort of bids that we're making at the minute, um, some of that's to replace the cap payments. Um, so we're talking about 339 million there. Uh, I'll just get the exact figures in front of me. Um, and then, um, sorry, I need to address that, sorry. Oh, yeah. Um, and then, obviously, then resources for people, including £18.8 million pounds worth of Brexit staffing resources. Again, these are these are pressures, um, so you know they, they haven't been met as yet. Um, we're looking at strategic environmental programmes. We've got some significant uh, resource spending there, around £3 million. Pounds. Um, that we're Much, sorry, in environmental? Environmental, strategic environmental programmes. So these are additional environmental programmes. Mm -hmm. Again, David can talk about them in more detail. But the idea is to, to get more um, environmental improvements. Mm -hmm. um, so those are the main priorities. I mean, there's, a, a, there's apart from people, a regular standing budget, a big pressure on it, as the Minister has said, is the £40 million for uh, TB. Uh, and a lot of that, a tw about £25 million pounds of that, is, is on compensation. Um, that has actually reduced a bit this year. Um, our projections this year have gone down a bit. Now, I'm, we're wary about saying that that's all good news because, as you know, diseases operate in cycles. 
and I'm sure Robert will have talked about that in more detail, but there is some indication that the stricter testing that they've been doing has made some impact, albeit it has not addressed the problem, but that has led to small reduction. Uh, well, in relative terms, £4 million pounds is really important, but you know it's, it's led to a, a reduction in, in some of the costs this year. Yeah. And um, your capital expenditure, what sort of high, um, what sort of main projects will you be taking on, at, like headline projects, etc.? So, so the, you know, there's there's things around uh, the sort of some of the stuff we talked about under um, later, some of the sort of capital work around that. Um, there's there's some uh, there's an amount around six point sixteen point eight million pounds in terms of bids there at this point in time. Waste recycling program. Again, about eight million pounds, eight and a half million pounds for that. Digital transformation, as we were talking about earlier, yeah. again a major element, about fourteen million pounds. I'm sure we've got these. You know, we can send up additional detail as you as you want. Um, estate development is important, and particularly, you know, we're looking at uh, options around our estate because it's not just used by us. Obviously, there's some of our off estate. The minister will be looking at options around that. Um, and then you're into research and development, where you've got big chunks of, of capital around research and development, again, with the, the aim of uh, improving productivity and environmental sustainability. So we can, pick up, we can pick up on any of those if you want more detail on, certainly. Well, I, I presume you will be coming to the committee to present your budget at some stage? Uh, Yes, um, I'm just uh, sorry. I'm, I'm out of practice here. Actually, oh, yeah, just, you, you've just told me I'd be very, we'll be very happy to do that. Certainly, uh -huh. I was going to suggest the same thing. So, just, right. very happy. Sorry. sorry, sorry, I, I should have been on a budget bill. Yeah, well, that's I'm okay with you. Absolutely, yeah. no, we'll be happy to come back and do that. Sorry, it took me a second. I'll have to get back into the get, get back into the routine. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Chair. Um, on staff numbers and estates, and with um, EU exit. Could you maybe tell me of your 2,900 staff, how many are those are new positions? Um, oh, uh, in post at the minute, I think we we'll maybe come back to you with the latest. It's 200-ish, is it? We've got three, in, 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 in post at the minute. Um, you know, it has been a challenge for us to actually have a net yeah, gain it's, it's, uh, within the department. It's 289 Brexit, but mm. we we have. I mean, this is the this is part of the problem about it. Again, it's defining what Brexit. We've had general pressures, so we've added. I think we've got a net increase of about 140. I mean, to be honest with you, the challenge for us has been not just numbers in terms of resources. It's actually been getting people in. Now, I, I should say. As a department, we're not bad that way. I mean, if you take a look at the people survey, and there's a new people survey due, due to come out, we've actually we, um, we've we've been improving very significantly in terms of engaging our people, and that's both the right thing to do, but it's also really important to prepare ourselves for all of these changes coming up. So we've put a lot of emphasis on that, um, but it means that in net terms, we've only increased by maybe um, well only we've increased by 150, I think. Um, you know, over our original headcount, but that that reflects the fact that there's people leaving. I mean, actually, ironically, it's a good thing in one way. We lose quite a few people in the professional roles because they're in great demand in the private sector. Um, so it's a challenge, but it still presents a challenge for us. Satisfied with that? Thank okay. you. Okay. Thank you. Um, have we got William? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In relation to the um, environmental performance scheme. Um, and I see here the department has not yet fulfilled all the original conditions of the outline business case. I think what David did say, you're probably at a stage that you have that completed by now, is that...? Yeah, so the, the, there, were, there were quite a few obligations and commitments written into the business case approval, and we delivered on most of those, but there were one or two where we, where we were slow to deliver. And one of those was around how we would monitor and evaluate what the scheme actually delivered. So we were required to develop a monitor monitoring and evaluation framework, and we were slow to deliver that. Um, but the issue that, that caused, I suppose, if there was concern or just a, a need to look carefully at what the scheme was doing, was more around the option uptake that farmers are actually selecting under tranche one and tranche two. And we found one or two options appearing to be very, very popular. Um, but potentially at the expense of other options, which would also deliver wider environmental benefits. So we, we thought it was right and appropriate to take time um, just to, 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 to look at that in more detail to see why is that happening, you know, what, what are the consequences of it happening in terms of the benefits that we're trying to get out of the scheme. 
Uh, and that's really what, what triggered the need to look, to look a bit more carefully, William, at um, Tron's three applications. We have since done all of the work required, we think, around the monitor, monitoring and evaluation framework. We have a strong framework in place uh, that will involve commissioning dedicated research so that we can uh, identify in four or five years' times at the end of an agreement period what has changed, what have the benefits been, and what, what's the relative value for money off that. So I think that was important work to do. Uh, we've now done that, and that now allows us to set down the options for proceeding with tranche three, which is to say are going to the minister now. I think it is important. I had a, a number of contractors contacted me back some months ago, unsure whether or not to purchase posts, yep. which were very difficult to get last year, as you were, in the pension scheme. So, I mean, there's left them with loose end. Some people have ordered large amounts of posts now they're sitting not sure whether to go ahead with it or not because they don't know what's yeah. happening in the scheme. So I think it's important that whatever decisions made, it's made very soon, you know, I think. Yeah, no, I agree. I was speaking to the scheme manager before Christmas, and I was assured by mid-January the department should be in a position, you know, so we're yeah. at the end of January. So well, I we, think we were always aiming for as soon as possible in the new year. Um, it's possibly taking an extra week or two, but we, we are at a point now where we're clear on how we feel we ought to proceed. Um, subject to the minister agreeing uh, the options that we presented, but I agree. I agree the point. The sooner I guess make, vital the sooner that decision, decision, that decision is you know clarified and made clear. I, yeah, I understand. Totally. Couldn't, couldn't agree more. And I have to say, I would totally accept that point. Um, it's it's not it's not exactly where we'd want to be. What I would say is it's been a a very uh, helpful process in one sense because we've really drilled down into how to assess environmental benefits, and I actually think. There's a huge challenge in the middle of that. I mean, it's something that we'll need to think about our po in our policy programme going forward because I'll give you an example of that. If you take a look at something like phosphate going into rivers, we know that that is very damaging and we know that schemes that can help to reduce that um, will have a value. Yeah. Um, the challenge is converting that value into financial terms. This is, again, this is not something here. And one of the things that really worries me about that is when people say things like, um, well, you know, you can look at tourism and, you know, potential tourism benefits with a clean environment. Yes, that's absolutely the case, but that's only a fraction of it. How do you put a value on pollinators, for example? Yeah. And I think there's something about, on, we're on, potentially we, not, not generally, I'm talking about in terms of the economic cases that we make, we need to find a better way of valuing those. And this has driven us to do yeah. that. So it hasn't just been, I wouldn't want to give the impression it's been people sort of sitting there <coughs> thinking about it. It's actually been a, it's been a really rigorous process yeah. here. Uh, and I can I, understand I, some I, environmental, you, you could be improving the environment, but making the case and proving a point financially is, is more difficult, I understand that. But I think that... But it, it needs to be done, and it needs to be done quickly, <coughs> I would accept I think it. it's vital. I think it's, it's, yeah. it's just not acceptable that people hanging on no. doesn't know what's happening. And okay. I think the, minister, the minister will appreciate that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, hey, William, I'm John. Um, Chairperson, uh, I think since the last time I remember this assembly having a discussion of this nature, things have certainly moved on in a big way, and we haven't mentioned cows fluctuating at all, uh, which created all sorts of laughs and giggles in the past. Uh, what I've heard this morning is extremely encouraging, and I think uh, a lot of it has been, uh, I think, promoted and, and motivated by, by Dennis and the time when we weren't uh, meeting. But uh, members are aware that there is an increasing demand for an independent environment agency. And uh, while I acknowledge that you have very carefully kept the two issues very separate, uh, I, I, I just wonder if the current situation is adequate to <coughs> deliver because I think it was the American civil rights uh, leader, Martin Luther King, who said, if you're not in charge of production, well, you really don't influence anything. Uh, we, the Assembly in the past has been very poor at bringing forward legislation. Uh, has Dennis anything in mind that might uh, feast this uh, committee on how to ensure that we actually deliver because previously when I asked the Minister about the relationship between uh, your department and the local councils, uh, I believe it was suggested that some committee might look at it. 
it's not adequate and you know uh, that it hasn't delivered. And it has left our planning uh, departments in a terrible state because they don't really know what to do. And sometimes elected representatives are in a quandary too because there, there is a, 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 there's an encouragement to promote the creation of jobs and so on, but at the same time, uh, fundamentally destroying the environment. And I, in the few minutes we have, I would just ask for your views on what I've said. Well, uh, th there's a lot. There's a lot in that. I suppose the first thing, just briefly, on the Office of Environmental Protection and the Environment Agency uh, proposal, as set out, as set out in uh, the uh, New Decade uh, New Approach document, there are two specific sets of functions. There, one is the office. The Office of Environmental Protection is about um, the uh, taking over the EU functions, yeah. and the and I know you understand that. Uh, Mr. Um, just checking that colleagues. And the other piece is then the Environment Agency, which is um, part of David's group at the minute. Um, so all of those functions need to be looked at, and we would need to give Minister options mm -hmm. around that, and we're just working those up at the minute. Yeah, that's so good. that's the first thing. And then I suppose then after that, on the ammonia issue, um, Minister touched on it earlier. Um, David's doing... Uh, a review of that has been done. Yeah. Review and actually, their, their recommendations due to come to the minister. Yeah. But before anything around ammonia on that front would happen, we would need to go to consultation. We think, sure. and that's you. our that's our thinking at the moment. Is that okay? Yeah. Thank you, um, Morris. Thank you, Chair. Uh, just a question on, on waste management, and it's the the, uh, the issue around plastic. I believe that eighty percent of our Beach litter is plastic, and of all the plastic that's in the oceans and the seas, only seven percent is at the top. The rest all down through various various layers. But what's the department's plans to reduce, especially plastic packaging, which is the main culprit? What's the department's plans to reduce plastic? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, that, 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 that's something that we have begun to think about. So we, we don't have a, a clear set of plans at the moment, or a clear set of interventions that we will be proposing but we're at the point of of um, considering the issue in, in a bit more detail than we've done in the past you're aware of the carrier bag levy which is already in place yep. that's something that we will continue to review in terms of its appropriateness but that has had a big big impact in terms of taking out plastic bags from the environment i think over one billion plastic bags r removed since we introduced the, the levy but there are other elements of plastic that we need to consider and i take the point totally so uh, we, we, we have been working with other uh, regions across the UK in terms of, of plastic, plastic bottles, plastic bottle return scheme, where we, we have reserved options on, on that. But, but I think we recognise that we, we need to look in more detail at what the other interventions and measures might be, but we're at the start of that process. Um, but it, it's an area that I think was mentioned in New Decade, New Approach, as, as a, a specific area of, of attention, so we will be looking at that in more detail alongside a whole range of other issues, you know, particularly around, around the climate change challenge. Um, but plastics is, and single-use plastics is also something we will be looking at now in more detail. Thank you. Uh, can I ask a supplement? Yeah. Yeah. The, the other issue is uh, how do we get rid of plastic? Uh, do we send it across to foreign countries who then dump it in lorries and tip it into the sea? Or is there any tangible way that we can say that's how it's been dealt with right across until it's actually dealt with? Uh, opposed to selling away somewhere and they actually then dump it in the sea. Yeah. So I, I, I can't give you an exact answer in terms of, of it's the, 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 the absolute end point in, in that process, but you know we have, we have been working very hard on recycling and plastic would be one of the elements that goes into the re your recycling bin. Um, and we have achieved a, a, a pretty good level now of household re waste recycling at 50%, but tracking that plastic then through the whole process to the end point is something I'd need to come back to the committee on. I think I think there's a really good question there because I suspect yeah. a lot of the recycling that's go out of the, out of the country to, to be managed, and as you have yeah. picked up on. And I think it would just be interesting to see. I know, for example, there's pa paper recycling. There's certain companies that use that locally, and that's great. And I'm just not so sure about plastic, so it's probably worth us following Maybe up. Maybe come back with it. Yeah, yeah. No, if I think chair's happy, really, I'll, I'll come you. back. Really good question. On that point. Yeah. Thank you, yeah. Morris. Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Um, and it's great to hear that you are becoming a wee bit more aware of the cross-cutting nature, and you know, um, but the fundamental integrated nature of all of this. Um, well, it's good to hear. It, 
actually depresses me a wee bit as well, you know, that these conversations are just beginning because it's, it should be the heart of all future planning. Um, and particularly, you know, for me, I feel that the Environment Agency should have been leading all this. So for it to be sort of a level of new thinking or it's just coming to the table or we're just starting to look at strategies through that type of lens, I think, um, yeah, I've taken note of and I'll go back and apply that to a few of the examples that the Minister gave while he was here, um, particularly when he was saying that we're doing well in our carbon reduction and while that's grand and true um, UK wide, um, we're not the same with our gas production, so our greenhouse gases for example are not on that level and certainly our ammonia levels are absolutely shocking on a UK level as well, so you know there's this disparity in what we're trying to put ourselves out to doing and the electric car model, again, the, this level of thinking at that strategic level still predicated on individual ownership rather than a massive investment in public transport and how do we manage to move around our spaces. Um, you know, so we can't be relying on all those things and again, applying that to our agri-food uh, and farming again as well. So the Minister's telling us, for example, TB um, is <clears throat> making it hard for us to sell our beef to China but yet our farmers are suffering a 25% reduction and our supermarkets are flying. And you know, our supermarkets are important from other countries while our own system is failing to, to, to flourish here. Um, and it's all those levels of, of how is this not working together uh, and how we're only starting to begin to look at that now. So, and I do have concerns about the Office of the Environmental <laughs> Protection and I completely get what you're saying about its remit. Um, but where's the thinking in the department? I mean, where are we really on seriously establishing an independent environment agency and at the level of strategic responsibility that you guys have in terms of this centralised notion that at the heart of everything should be environmental protections and mitigations because from there everything else flows? Well, I, th I think there's a... You know, um, it does a lot in that. Um, I think one thing I would say is uh, we've been very open and the first day brief that you've got is exactly the first day brief that the Minister got, With even with the remarks to the Minister you may wish to, and we deliberately did, did it that way, we deliberately sent it, so you've got it in black and white, there's where we are. I think um, that doesn't paint a great picture in terms of all our environmental indicators and we'll be the first to be open about that. There's more we can do. Some issues such as environmental, independent environmental agencies are big political issues that require political leadership and politicians to take decisions on them, yeah. uh, notwithstanding the fact that we can feed into that and we quite correctly will feed into that. But again, very much take your point. So we haven't been able to obviously uh, take decisions like that. Um, I think then though, when you come to one thing I would say, which hopefully give a bit of positivity to all of this, what I, think has been, what I think is different and where we're getting to is we've had a lot of talk and you get it about, about, for example, greenhouse gases. And a lot of the conversation around greenhouse gases almost feels like we know there's something really bad going wrong. We know what it looks like at a high level, but we don't exactly know how to fix it. And it, at, when it comes down to individual levels, we know some of the general, general statements. We can make general statements about combustion engines. We can make general statements about different types of um, energy production and so on. But what we're trying to do now is really hone that down. So, for example, if you take farming, so a third of our greenhouse gas, or 27% of our greenhouse gas emissions are due to farming. So now we're starting to get to the point of saying, well, it's not enough to just say there's a big problem and that we need to do something about it. We need to be able to have conversations with people to say, actually, this is what a hedge is worth. This is what it's worth in terms of carbon. This is what it's worth in terms of biodiversity because you're creating a wildlife corridor. This is how we can actually give that a value. This is how we can feed this into a new um, policy. So to be fair, there are things changing, many of which are challenging in their own right, but which do have spurred us in to, into saying, well, actually, you know, a lot of the, for example, a lot of policy around cap payments was fixed. And as Norman has said earlier, we're now going to be looking at that as part of uh, how we move forward. And as we do that, that gives us new levers to be able to take some of the things that, you know, to the next level. So I suppose it's really narrowing it down to the day we can have a conversation with a farmer to say, here's how much carbon is on your farm, we're getting there. And here's how we can help you to, to, to do something better. And by the way, here's how we can make sure then that the supermarkets recognize that. Because there's been a big change, in, even in the last three years, there's been a huge change, as you know, in terms of um, the populations 
views about this, which is fantastic, that level of awareness. So, um, you know, and so not at all hiding the fact we have very, very serious issues to deal with. To be fair, I remember in 2009 working on recycling in a previous life, and people saying we'd never get beyond 30% recycling. So we have made some progress, but definitely a lot more to do. In all of this, we need a much more sophisticated analysis mm -hmm. than what we have at the minute. Uh, because sometimes you could move to try and solve a problem and you actually find that you haven't solved it, you've shifted it somewhere else. Mm -hmm. um, Plastic waste. Or, mm -hmm. good, good yeah. example. Yeah. Of course, it's a conversation about <coughs> reducing, <coughs> less production. But again, talking about carbon yeah. footprint. Um, our carbon footprint as consumers is very different from our carbon footprint as producers. Uh, in terms of where that carbon actually emerges. Uh, therefore, we need to have a much more sophisticated analysis and discussion and, uh, and understanding uh, and policy making process uh, to actually think our way through all of those issues. Um, and that's why I think you know, we do need to take a bit of time to understand the science, uh, to invest in the science, uh, so that what we do actually is the right thing uh, rather than necessarily uh, take the obvious step which may, may turn out to be the wrong step. Uh, so we'll have to work our way through this very carefully. But nevertheless, Claire, I do understand your frustration. Um, the the single-use plastic issue did become a big, a much bigger issue last year than, than it had been previously. So we may have been slow <coughs> to respond on, on the plastics issue, but, but I can assure you that in light of what has happened over the last year or two, we, we, we are responding. Um, I mentioned the deposit return scheme, so we were part of the UK-wide consultation, ensuring we kept our options open on that. We're part of the UK-wide consultation on producer responsibility, which is specifically what you make around responsibility for packaging. Um, we haven't made as much progress on greenhouse gas reductions as we'd like, 18% reduction since the base year, which you know about. Um, but you know that what, what has achieved that, the interventions that were put in place to achieve that, like the efforts around renewable energy, have kind of delivered as much as they can. So we are now working very, very closely with other departments around what are the, what are the next steps, the next interventions that will take Northern Ireland to where it needs to be in terms of, of contributing to the UK net zero target, uh, net zero target of uh, by 2050 on carbon. Um, so look, we, we haven't been resting on our lawns. We, our lawns we've done very well, I think, on household waste recycling, and that's the result of a very clear effort around recycling. Um, but I, I, I recognise the point you're making, and you know we, we need to we need to keep working on a whole range of initiatives that will move us in, into a better place. I mean, just to show we're not being debated. I mean, there's there's issues around water quality as well, yeah. which you've only you know, and very open. There's we just need to do something about that. There's no question about it. But the, the question is how we do that. Yeah. Air quality and yeah. so much. Yeah. So we've again we've been very open about that in the first day brief, and uh, that's where we are. And it's uh, and it's great now that we've got this. Now that we're with the restoration, I think that gives us a real opportunity to make some more yeah. progress on it. Can I ask, um, David, um, when, when is it expected the environmental bill will be introduced to Westminster? It's being introduced today, as I understand it, at noon today, so just about to happen, I think. And will we, will this be, will we have a, an LCM we'll yeah. process here, and will, will, will we have the opportunity to... And yeah, so again, the, the, the timetable that, that DEFRA are placing around the bill is, is going to create difficulties for us just in terms of the, the speed at which it's likely to move. But the bill, as I understand it, is being introduced at noon today. Um, the Minister mentioned the, the requirements for legislative consent motions, so there will be a requirement on the Environment Bill. Um, if possible, I'd like to come and brief the committee if, if within the next week or two. And I think that time frame is, is dictated by the DEFRA timetable um, around the legislative consent, consent motion, get into a bit, bit more detail around the provisions within the bill where we have retained options for the Assembly, um, and then talk, talk the committee through just the next st likely stages in terms of the legislative consent motion, which would involve letters from the Minister to the Executive and debate them within the Assembly. Um, but the, the timetable in place for the Environment Bill it's very compressed, you know. So I think all of this is going to happen probably within the next six to eight weeks. That's the kind of time frame. Why? Why is the timetable so compressed? 
Uh, I don't know. I mean, we, we've been engaging with DEFRA for months and months on an environment bill as, as the bill was drafted and the various provisions were drafted and we were ensuring where we could that we retained options for Northern Ireland and for the returning assembly. Um, uh, but when, when after the general election, um, DEFRA then articulated their intended deadlines, both for the environment bill, agriculture bill, mm -hmm. And the fisheries bill, and it's very compressed time. I suppose tables. the main the main issue is it's been <coughs> it's been going on for some time over the last year. What we've tried to do, just as, as David says, at every step of the way, we, we we took a view early on that we could have. I mean, this was one of those kind of difficult decisions about. In one sense, the the safest option as officials would be to say, well, actually, we can't even get involved, but we wanted to make sure that that we had the options open for ministers returning, and that's what we've tried to do. So we've tried to. So it may be, in some, some people's minds, it might not go as far as we want, mm -hmm. and others, um, you know, that we, there's some things we should have signed up to already, and there's, but we've, we've, what we've tried to do is to strike an appropriate balance in terms of governance to say, let's make sure that ministers and the Assembly coming back can, can exercise options. as many yeah. of the options as possible that they wish to. And, and it, that doesn't preclude then further legislation coming forward as well, mm -hmm. if, if that doesn't meet the Assembly's needs. If you're looking in there, that it was just to support David's suggestion that he come back to brief at, at the earliest possible stage with as, as much yeah. information as possible. Yeah. And yeah. Tell you to Okay. Okay. Well, folks, this um, has been a very wide ranging discussion this morning with the ministerial briefing and yourselves, um, Dennis, David, and Norman, to flesh it out and answer all of our questions. And we're very appreciative of that. And it's, it's a huge amount of areas covered and this will be followed up by specific individual briefings. So I want to thank you very much for coming before the committee and no doubt we'll be seeing you again in the in the near future. Very good. Okay. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, Okay. Can I ask the, the committee's agreement here that we seek out a research briefing, briefing on the various LCMs relating to the, um, the Westminster Thanks. Bills on Agriculture, Fisheries, Environment, and a briefing on the, the NA protocol and the impacts it will have on the agreement? Yep. Three, two, three. And uh, a, department, um, a departmental briefing on Brexit to cover the issues noted in the Minister's brief at paragraph two. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, just m moving on ahead, um, we have one apologies for, apology for today's meeting, that's from uh, John Blair, and yep. everyone else is present. Uh, draft minutes. Uh, members, on six pages 6 to 20 of your pack, there is the, um, the minutes of the meeting from Thursday, last Thursday, 23rd of, um, of January. Uh, are members content with that? Yeah. 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 Okay, yeah. Okay, um, departmental briefing on the backlog of statutory rules. Um, members, we'll now be dealing with the remaining backlog of statutory rules, and I want to remind you that the first two are the rules dealing with the sea fish licensing that we defer taking a decision on. And the written briefing for members is page 46 to 50 in your pack. And the officials are here today to answer any questions that the members may have in relation to SR 2019 and, and SR. SR 2019 and SR 2019 and SR 2019 and SR 2019 and SR and excuse my ignorance uh, <laughs> on all of us because I've asked a number of questions and I'm still really not content in my own head that I've got the answers or, or understand uh, the, the impacts. Uh, so I'm, I'm probably going to just simplify a statement in terms of the impact of uh, particularly 65, but both of these. Uh, I mean, currently the fishing vessels are, are, cons are under the common fisheries policy and that uh, the, the changes suggested, or I'm asking this question, if the changes suggested in this are going to have an impact in that they're going to impose 
restrictions or border or whatever language you want to use on particularly well EU vessels, but particularly vessels from the south uh, fishing in, in waters that they currently are able to do. I mean, uh, is that basically the nut hub of these uh, SRs? Okay, if I could answer that question. They, uh, currently we're part of the EU, as you say. Um, the EU has its own regulations for um, licensing fishing by third country vessels into the EU, um, which we will be um, caught up with uh, when we leave. So we will become a third country and the EU will become a third country to us. So currently, uh, if a country like Norway, for example, um, wishes to fish uh, in EU waters, uh, it would require an authorisation from the EU and vice versa. If an EU vessel wanted to fish in Norway waters, it would require an authorisation from the EU. That authorisation would contain conditions that the vessel has to comply with when it's in the other area's waters. And those would be um, the conditions to, to uphold whatever agreement exists between the two countries. So the licensing, our licensing is just the means of achieving the authorisation. So uh, if our vessels want to fish in EU waters after we leave, um, they, we're going to have to have an authorisation from the EU. And if Irish vessels want to fish in our waters, um, we're going to have to give them an authorisation. And that authorisation is for an Irish vessel is actually required by the EU law. So the EU law says you can't go and fish in a third country's waters unless you have an authorisation from that third country. So our licensing is the means of achieving that authorisation. So it is going to be, there is a negative impact on what currently uh, is the process uh, as a result of this? Yes, okay. that's, that's, an, that's an inevitable consequence of leaving, unfortunately. Can I just be add in there, Philip, if it's okay? Um, can you just confirm the, detent, the department's intention to revoke the uh, 61? The, the, uh, my understanding is that you have an intention to revoke the sea fish licensing. Uh, one nine sixty one. Yes, there's two we're dealing with here. Yes, uh, you, um, we, we will be revoking that because and I'll just have an update from the paper we sent you. We've got further legal advice this week. Um, the latest drafts of the bill also replicate the provisions that are in the licensing and notices amendment regulations. So we will be revoking both of those when the bill has assent. We will be revoking both of those, both of the order and the regulations because they will cease to have any legal effect. Well, what, what is the timeline? Because I'm conscious of our timeline here in the Assembly. Yes. We have, we, we have I think we have five sittings mm -hmm. passed already. Um, we have to, if we're going to look to annul any of these, we have to do it inside the ten sittings. And that's excluding it being processed through the business office. So um, are you saying that these will be revoked? Uh, you know, we will, but when they... Um, at the same, our intention is at the same time that the bill is passing through Westminster, um, before it's enacted, we will have brought forward um, revocation regulations for those, so that the effect would be at the same time as the bill is enacted, the, those order, the order and the regulations would be revoked at the same time. So we will be bringing forward a separate revocation order, and there might be other bits of legislation that we have to amend or revoke over the course of this year to comply with the, the um, end of us finally leaving at the end of the implementation period. Okay. Um, so that, that's the answer, that's both the both these that are, that are in front of us here? Yes. Mm -hmm. So our, our intention would be to bring forward a separate piece of legislation, a revocation order that would revoke those pieces of legislation. Oops, sorry. Me, me, uh, I understand what you're saying in terms of uh, revoking them. Uh, I mean, personally, I mean, I couldn't support uh, the SR65. I mean, this institution uh, voted last week in the Assembly uh, overwhelmingly against the negative impacts of Brexit. I mean, I see this as the outworking of, of, of that on our, on our seawaters. I mean, I, I mean, I would be proposing that we don't support uh, the the uh, SR65, uh, I mean, um, if there's something yeah. that happens further down the line that makes it irrelevant, well, then that so be it. But I mean, I certainly couldn't support. Yeah. Uh, um, could I just 
61 is the licensing order, and that's the one that will require a license. 65 okay. is the license and notices regulations, okay. which is just, just uh, deals with the way we communicate a license. Fair enough. Sorry, that's both of them. Both of them, same. Yeah, okay. yeah. Two sexes. See, see, rather than wait for the, the bill, the license, but why, why can they not be revoked by the department now? Sorry, could you just repeat the Why can they not be revoked by the department now? Why, why, why must you issue a revocation order? Uh, because it, it's a, a legal technicality. We've been told that um, the revocation must be made by the legislation that made the, reg the regulation in the first place, so they won't put it in the bill. They okay, so we, we, we did it ourselves under our own devolved powers. Oh, they don't want to put that, they can't put that in the bill, they say. Um, yeah. I mean, we can discuss that with them and put it in the bill. But bear in mind that these provisions that are licensing are going to be in, are in the draft bill. So, yeah, yeah. sure. Probably, it might be uh, worth sharing that particular section that's in the bill, which uh, omits um, section four of the Sea Fisheries Conservation Act, 1967, which actually under which these two particular SRs were made. The, the bill provides for that clause, or, sorry, that section in the 67 Act yeah. to be omitted. So once, that's, once that piece of legislation goes through and that section is omitted or, or revoked, any SRs that are made under it will fall automatically. But we also will do a tidy up to, to um, bring forward an SR which revokes them in, in our domestic legislation. John? Chairperson, I hope I'm in order, but could I propose that this is taken back again with a, a, a more detailed explanation in print of what you're saying, because to me this is far too serious for me to make a decision on. I did raise this the previous day. We don't want to be part of a situation that causes all sorts of embarrassments in Strangford Lock or wherever it is, or Lock Foyle. It really, if that indicates I don't understand it, well, then that's a perfectly good reason for asking for uh, fuller and better information so we know exactly what's happening. And the currently, there currently is a process, for example, with Norway and the EU, and it works very well, where we um, share information about the vessels in which to access each other's waters, and we license each other's vessels. Well, Chairperson, yeah. I would like to see that in print. I, I just can't absorb it coming up at the table. At the last minute, it really isn't. It doesn't make me very happy. I mean, I agree with that. I mean, I, I, I'm happy enough to defer this if we have time to bring it back at a further stage. And uh, I mean, I know you keep using the example of Norway. I mean, my concern is is the fishing vessels of this island uh, and the impact that it will have on current uh, policies and positions. So, I mean, I accept. And agree with John, and, and we certainly need more detail, and more detail specifically about the impacts of all island fishing, and and, and uh, you know Loch Foyle and Strangford and Kilkeel, uh, and current all island bodies that look after this as well. And I think that's key. Happy to give you more information. Yeah. Right. Just as a supplementary, Chair, uh, when you bring this explanation back, or this uh, brief back, did you also have have something that? Uh, can let the committee know the type of vehicles, or the type of vehicles, type of, of, of vessels that uh, you would allow in uh, yep. UK waters and an all island water base. I'm talking specifically about these big factory ships that sit off the North Atlantic yep. coast and clean up the whole area. Is there any way of preventing that type of fishing? Um, that, that type of fishing doesn't uh, normally happen. Uh, doesn't normally it, happen. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. Ha there's no. It depends on you find as, as, as a factory ship. Mm -hmm. it, it, that will be a part of the uh, whatever access agreements are negotiated with um, the EU. Um, and the, 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 one of the reasons for having the authorisations is that you you can't have a, a large Dutch factory ship coming into the Irish Sea because the mm -hmm. authorisation will specify um, that it's only allowed to fish in the, the North Sea. Okay. For example. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, all right. Thank you, Chair. Uh, my thoughts would be just that it would need to be two-way. You know, if um, vessels coming into our jurisdiction 
are allowed in, then ours would have to be allowed out to us. That's, you know, as long as it's fair, you know, it works both ways, couldn't just be one way. I understand? Yeah. 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 yeah, probably for many of us, we don't fully understand <coughs> the, what the implications are. Yeah. To me, this is temporary, is that right? Till negotiations are completed no, or to what, new legislation from um, what, the UK? What, what the bill will do, it, it, what it's doing is providing the means to licence um, other? No, other, other vessels. It doesn't, that doesn't automatically mean that we have an access agreement. The access agreement is separate. So if an access but, agreement... So in the short time this is, this is clearing the way for all the vessels to come into our... Is that... No, no. No? No, no. Uh, the current arrangements exist while we're in the implementation period. Um, during this year, uh, we will be starting to negotiate as a coastal state um, on our own terms with the Faroes, with Norway, with the EU. Yeah. Um, depending on the outcome of those access arrangements, um, we will, we may or may not be facilitating access to each other's waters. Yeah. Either side will have to have a means of licensing or authorising. Yep. the vessels to be in our waters. So mm -hmm. all, the, all, the provi all these provisions are doing is providing us with the means to issue that authorisation and provide conditions in that authorisation. It does not automatically mean um, that we're granting access. Access will only be, the authorisation will only be provided to those countries where we have negotiated access. But the, the similar members have concerns. What happens immediately tomorrow on Saturday morning? Nothing changes. Nothing, no difference. Nothing changes. Nothing changes. No difference. I know that then. Yeah, that's okay. Yeah, I think it's important just to go back that these two SRs were made under the No Deal planning assumptions. You know where we were likely to crash out at the 31st of March, and that's that's why these two SRs were fundamentally in place at that time. Yeah, the intention. There's no effect. The intention is no always, effect. always to put these provisions into the Fisheries Bill, but the 29th of March. And last year, the bill wasn't in place, so we very quickly had to bring forward um, these SRs to fill the gap uh, in the event that there was a crash out, no deal. And a, a further issue you raised last week was your concerns about the speed at which those were brought in and about w were the industry actually consulted, but they were consulted fully through the UK white paper on uh, future uh, sustainable um, fisheries for future generations. So there was full consultation, both on a UK-wide basis, which had a you know big response, and then also um, we had our own um, stakeholder forum here within within Northern Ireland, where we presented um, all the elements of the of the white paper, which was uh, explaining to industry how access would work once we move out of um, once we uh, leave leave the EU. Um, and I suppose it's worth saying that uh, you know the industry was again to protect uh, to pr pr protect um, the, the resources within UK waters. They were very much um, in support of that, and they also understand that the relationship will change then with their movement into into uh, EU waters. Because as Paddy says, this is a reciprocal uh, business, and that. Uh, our vessels using EU waters or waters in the Republic of Ireland will equally need, um, you know, need to be licensed as well. So it's, it's, it, it's, it's just uh, uh, um, the necessary uh, pieces of legislation to go in place to reflect the new arrangements, um, whether we like those or not. But they are reciprocal. Okay. Well, um, William, do you want back in there? Yeah, well, I mean, as, as I see it, the, it makes no difference the next morning. So, you know, it's, it's not it's not creating a problem that I, that I can see. You know. well, can I say that am I picking up that there would be consensus that we need a bit more time to absorb this, hear the detail of it, and to come back again? Is that fair enough? Yeah. Fair. Yeah. What What about sorry the because the, the fisheries bill was laid yesterday in Westminster and then there'll be a legislative consent motion mm -hmm. um, required from the Assembly as part of that. And is that... Is that well, we, 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 we will be covering the licensing provisions in the bill when we come to tell you about it. So, uh, But you, I, we can certainly provide a more detailed paper and try and explain, expand on some of the issues you've raised. Yeah. 
Bob, do you want to come in there? No, I was just, uh, uh, Paddy's probably uh, put the point I was going to make. No, uh, in terms of all of the issues that we're asking and the questions, we obviously want them explained, but it would be useful if we have the, 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 the timetable, the other options that, that you've talked about. And, you know, you, you mentioned their, their <coughs> revocation of these, you know, how that process works and when it's happening. Yes. Okay, thank you very much, Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, thank you very much. Um, I want to refer members now to the written briefing at page 70 to 78, and I would like to welcome uh, Wendy Lindsay the Deputy Principal of the Waste Strategy Branch. Uh, I'm going to take a few moments to read over the SR 29240 Waste Regulations um, 2018, page 70, 78. A few moments, then I'll open up the questions with uh, Lindsay. Andy, Okay, um, members, you had a few minutes there to read over the yes, and is there any questions that you'd like to ask of Wendy? Okay. Oh, members are, are content, um, I want to ask the question, <laughs> that the Committee for Environment, Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019-240 the Waste Regulations Northern Ireland 2019, and subject to examiner's statutory report, is no objection to the rule. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you, Wendy. <laughs> <laughs> if the next group of SRs uh, were deferred from Tuesday's meeting until the clerk received advice on the SRs that have been revoked. The revoked SRs are um, um, uh, SR 2018-184, 2019-49, 2019-99, 2019-158, Twenty nineteen one five one, twenty nineteen one six zero, twenty nineteen one six two, and these uh, SRs have been reenacted in SR twenty nineteen twenty nineteen two thirty. Um, uh, Stella, do you want to brief the committee on the approach? Yeah, I mean, I've, I've um, spoken to both our examiner statutory rules, our um, business office who record the SRs, and our clerk assistants here, and. Um, because these SRs have been revoked by SR 2019-230, and the provisions that have been in them have been reenacted, are now provided for in 2019-230. So the approach that um, has been suggested is that the committee, the committee can, or the committee can no longer annul these stat rules because they are no longer live. But the committee can, for example, comment on their provisions while they were live, so for the year or two or whatever the period of time that they were active. And the, um, the committee has already taken the evidence on the policy content and spoke to the officials in, in depth last Tuesday. It seems like last week. It was only last Tuesday. Um, so what we will be doing is with, for those ones there that we have noted down, those six that have been with me, as the chair read out there, the question will be put, and you will say if you're content or not content, or no object or no objections, and there will be a line put in that the committee, you know, has noted that these have been subsequently revoked by. So all you're doing is commenting on the period of time they were active, but because they're no longer active because they have been revoked, you cannot annul. So that power is gone. Yeah, so is, is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So, I don't know if you need the official. Do you want to? Yeah, mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so, I'd like to welcome back to the committee uh, John Joel Boyle, um, Chief Executive Forest Service. You're welcome, Thank you. John Joel. Um, there's a new department briefing on um, page 8082, and the policy aspects uh, of this was considered on Tuesday 28th. So, um, 
This question should therefore be focused on the procedural issues of revoking these statutes. There is one exception, it's 2017 155 on seed potatoes. I'll just take a minute to uh, read the department, departmental briefing on 80 to 82 um, before there's anybody has anything they want to ask. Members, um, no one has indicated that, they're, um, that they wish to ask any questions. I'd like to thank uh, John Joe for appearing before the committee today okay. in a <laughs> short, short uh, visit. Okay. And, um, <laughs> and, um, okay. and I want to inform members that we have now put the deferred questions on these statutory rules. Uh, page 106 to 128. Um, that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Development, Rural Affairs has considered SR 217086, the Environmental Impact Assessment Forestry Amendment Regulations NA 217, subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to this rule. Agreed. Agreed. That the Committee of the, uh, the, for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs has considered SR 217119, the Marketing of Fruit, Plant and prop Propagating Material Regulations NA 217, subject to the Examiner's Statutory Rules, there's no objection to the rule. Agreed. Okay, I refer members to page 170 to 176 uh, that the Committee of Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs has considered SR 217155, the seed potatoes and uh, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, there is no objection to the rule. Agreed. Okay. Um, that the committee for Ag the P committee for agriculture, environment, rural affairs has considered SR 2018 183, the marketing of ornamental plant propagating material and amendment regulations NA 2018, and subject to the examiner's statutory rules, there is no objection to the rule. Agreed. Agreed. Uh, the committee for agriculture, environment, rural affairs. First, has considered SR 2018 the Plant Health Order NA 2018. And subject to examiner's statutory rule report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. 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 Oh, sorry. But this, sorry, I should advise members that this one has been revoked by SR 2019230. Okay. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 201941. The Plant Health and Seeds Miscellaneous Amendments Regulation 2019 and subject to examiner strategy rules report is no objection to the rule. Great. Great. Um, that the next one uh, has been the 2019-49 Animal Plant Health Amendment Order 2019 has been revoked by SR 2019-2019-230. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs and concerned SR 2019-49, the Plant Health Amendment Order NA 2019 and subject to examiner strategy Sergeant so Rule's report has no objection to the rule. Indeed. Okay, the the uh, refer members three forty nine to three sixty. Uh, I put the question that the question that, that the committee for agriculture and environment rural affairs has considered SR two one nine fifty, the forest reproductive material amendment regulations NA twenty nineteen and subject to examiner statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Uh, that uh, the committee for agriculture environment rural affairs has considered SR two one nine seventy three. Plant Health Import and Inspection Fees Regulations NA 2019. Subject to exact, uh, examiner's statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. The, um, the next one, 2019-99 Plant Health Food and Bank Amendment Order, has been revoked by SR 209230. The Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs, etc., SR 219 Plant Health Food and Bank Amendment Order NA 2019, and subject to examiner's statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Great. Okay, uh, I want to advise members that the next one, uh, 2019 this SR has been revoked by 2019 um, With the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment <coughs> and Rural Affairs has considered SR 2019 the Plant Health Amendment Number 2 or RNA 2019 and subject to examiner's statutory rules report has no objection to the rule. Um, the, uh, I want to advise members. 219160, SR 219160 has been revoked by SR 219230. We'll put the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment, Rural Affairs, SR 2019160, the Plant Health Amendment Number 3 RNA 2018, and subject to examiner's statutory rules report, there's no objection to the rule. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. 
Agreed. Agreed. Um, the next one that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 219161, the marketing of plant and propagating material amendment regulations NA 219. And subject to examiner statute rules, the court has no objection to the ruling. Agreed. Agreed. Okay. okay, 219162, this has been revoked by SR 219230. With the question that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SR 219162, the Plant Health Food and Bark Amendment Number Two, Order N in Twenty Nineteen, and subject to Examiner Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Agreed. And uh, the next one is that the Committee for Agriculture, Environment and Rural Affairs has considered SO two one nine two three O, the Plant Health Officials Control and Miscellaneous Provisions Regulations NA Twenty Nineteen, and subject to the Examiner Statutory Rules Report, has no objection to the rule. Great. Great. And correspondence, I want you to refer to correspondence uh, in your pack, page 507 to 508. Um, each item of correspondence has a suggested action against it. If members are content, uh, come to act, are members content to action the correspondence as suggested? Great. Mm -hmm. Okay. Forward work programme, the memo from the clerk at page three, 535, five, 527 and 535. Um, Stella, do you want to brief the committee on the forward work programme? Yeah, members had indicated that they would like to get a visit in between now and Easter recess. Um, I'll remind you, keeping the LCM that are coming down the line at us, <laughs> you might not be able to do this. So there were some suggestions on Tuesday. Um, uh, Bally Kelly and Mavoy I took up to the north of the province. There was Larne and Belfast ports. Um, given the, the operational arrangements that are going to need to be put in place there. Um, there was AFBI itself, which has had a, a quite a big programme of uh, capital investment. There's CAFRE. Um, there's various, we heard today again about waste and, and plastic, so there's various waste um, it, um, plants and recycling and anaerobic digesters and plastic recycling that you could potentially look at. Um, it may be possible to organise a farm site visit. Now, again, I, I've had that organised in the past where uh, we went out and saw how a farm inspection for the single farm payment was done. Or we could perhaps liaise with CAFRI for when, it, maybe, for example, when they are getting TP testing, that you could go up and for those members who, you know, and see how that's done and, and the implications of that. Those are the kind of visits that actually can be done individually as well if you want. Or again, given that the fisheries um, bill is coming um, and there will be an LCM on that, um, it might be very useful to go out and visit somewhere like Kilkeel uh, and meet and speak to local fishermen and the fish producer organisations, although we do intend to have them in um, at a certain stage as well. And DERA do have a, a fishing vessel that is used for enforcement um, and checking, and it is um, it can be. Um, we could actually go down there and save that Kilkeel too as well. So I've given you a little a little blurb on each of those visits and what you might want to see. And it'll probably be, um, you know, again just looking at the LCMs in front of us. Maybe towards March rather than February that we get these in front of we get this done. But those are some um, options there for you. I don't know which ones you prefer to do. I'll do them all. <laughs> <laughs> I think maybe over two years you can maybe get to see them. You get to do them all. I have been at my way before, but yes. the committee went in the time. The last committee, the 2016-17 yeah. yeah. went, committee went, that was three years ago. To where, sorry? To, to, to my boy, illegal waste. Yeah. But the, there's not much to see all in salt green and grass, so you wouldn't mm -hmm. even know what's there. I mean, yeah. that's my view, but it's yeah. up to the rest of you, you know. Yeah. You know, you know. But you would, it wouldn't be just in my boy, you would also get a briefing from the departmental officials. On what you know, what happened there, why it happened. Yeah, yeah, and you would. But you know, you'd get that sort of overview briefing as well. An inquiry, though. And <laughs> <laughs> is it me? Is it something that we have to decide? I'm just thinking. Well, we haven't actually, as a committee, met to kind of prioritise our priorities. No, you haven't. And you know, uh, this may be something that actually Deferred. flows mm -hmm. from that, so that you're actually, you know, you're setting your priorities, and and you're doing a visit that. Ties in with it rather than just picking something that may may not be on our list or radar. Chairperson, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so boy is not too far away from the uh, head of Kelly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think I think the committee really should make a determined effort to visit there. Uh, if only because it's the headquarters. <laughs> Oh, I thought because it was your constituency, maybe. Do you want to say? Oh well. 
<laughs> Wood John's house for tea. Never thought <laughs> <of that. laughs> yeah. But I'll go with whatever. <laughs> You want that decision today? No, you can defer this again. You can, you know, you can decide if you want to wait. And, and said we will be hopefully getting some space in the next four weeks to do some strategic planning for the committee, and then decide based on that. Um, I'm sure, everyone has their own ideas too. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, can I just make a point that um, one of the things that I, I would definitely like is to do a bit of work around the. The rural support networks, the RCN, mm -hmm. the NA, uh, the, the rural women's network. You know those support networks are doing Trojan work in local communities, and they they would I suppose come under the rural affairs um, umbrella of data. And that's something that I just think we, I yeah. think I would like to. Yeah, we're you know, we're trying to get them scheduled in. Yeah, yeah trying and to get not them to them. No, yeah. no, I agree with all the other suggestions we have. That's one I just want to keep on the agenda as well. Yeah. So would you like to just defer consideration of those? Just sometimes it's, it's useful to, for the committee to be almost immediately out and about, being seen to be out and about, but uh, certainly you can defer some of that if you want. I do note that the, in fairness to the Minister, he has been out and about, you know, so I think it would be great for you know, us to... Uh, uh, the suggestion to go to the fisheries is a good one, just given what we've went through there as well, that, you know, it's not a, a great level of understanding maybe about the legislative changes coming down the line and the impact that Brexit is going to have there. I think also Bally Kelly House after all that's if that's the headquarters I think yeah, yeah. we've got mm -hmm. should be seen out and about immediately yeah. and that's one of the main places. Yeah. Okay. I think Chair, whatever's, I mean, Aye. still I can get together reasonably handy. Yeah. I'll, 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 I will, I'll put something together um, on those Bally Kelly House and uh, fisheries, but I will put them on the sort of towards the end of March, middle of March, end mm -hmm. of March, which means then if you do, if things do happen, you can easily change them or adjust them as, as required. Mm -hmm. Adapt right. yeah. Brexit's yeah. happening, we get to see what's happening on the board. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think that's a crucial one. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay, and the boards. I think, and actually, I'll, if you're content, I'll have a chat. The other two committees that'll have a big interest there are obviously the economy committee because they look after the businesses, and uh, maybe you've seen some other stuff going on the on the TV recently about haulage, um, um, and the infrastructure committee because mm -hmm. the the management of ports and airports yeah. calls to them. Yeah. So it might be something that is worthwhile thinking about. You know. Right. A joint, yeah. a joint. Yeah. It'll certainly fit in with Brexit very much. So yeah, yeah that would be good. Some of boats don't need MOT. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Okay. Okay. Um, the members of uh, any other business today? We, we, we do have some business in closed session today, ah. but it'll not take us long. Okay. So. Okay. So the didn't have next meeting uh, is scheduled for Tuesday, the fourth of February, at ten a.m. in this room. Can I get the commitment agreement of the committee here till we move into a closed session to consider some committee protocols? Indeed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.